Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Pastor. Um, I, honey, I'll explain why not to. Good to see you. Good to be with you. I know it looks a little bit different tonight. Um, that is because we are offering some credit, cop credit, for this course uh, through our national Baptist convention. And we have a leadership institute, Christian leadership institute here. Um, and we want to uh, honor what we are asked to do for those guys, for those requirements, for their guidelines. And so doing it a little bit differently, but as you see, you can still uh, join us uh, via Facebook and we're going to uh, share this replay on YouTube uh, following. Uh, we are, as you see on your screen, our Bible study series uh, going forward. Uh, it may only be this fall, it may go into January, it is the book of James, Hearing and Doing. You and I, uh, we know any scripture in James, uh, it's a few, it's probably about counted all joy, about going through trials, and then a piece about temptation. And next few weeks, we'll talk about the differences of trials and temptations. And then uh, we also know that verse, don't just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. So that's where our title comes from. Uh, that is, in a sense, the essence of the book of James. And then to a degree, all the scripture, beginning with Jesus, but that is the that is the essence of it. So whenever we study a book of the Bible, we start with determining who is the author as best we can discern of the book. Well, let me back up. Who is the author of all the books of the Bible? God. God. I wanted to make sure I was in the church. I wanted to make sure I was in the church. And I'm glad that multiple people said that, including the young people, that we know that ultimately God is the author of the Bible. God inspired people to write the Bible. And, and hence, that's why we have some uh, challenges in some pieces of the Bible. But the Bible is the word of God. Uh, however, uh, God uses people, and whenever God uses people, there are going to be some imperfections. Uh, and, and, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll say more about that as we go forward, uh, but we know that. But this book, let me, let me back up. I want to do this exercise because I want to, as best I can, equip you that when you study the Bible to be able to uh, catch the clues that may be there. Some books like James, it tells us at the beginning who the author is, as well as who the, uh, the first audience was for the book. But there are other books where uh, the information is found in the book. However, when we determine the author of a book, do we go by what somebody told us or do we go by something else? We go by what we're told. What's the danger in going by what we're told? It can be, it, well, not necessarily the wrong person. It can be, go ahead, I'm sorry, Brother Smith. You can get the wrong advice. Uh, other Brother Smith, you have something to add? I didn't think so. so. He, he heard his big brother talking, so he wanted to say something. It is not necessarily, it can be that, that we can get the information from the wrong person. It can also be someone not knowing any better. And I have to say that because sometimes we repeat things and believe they're true. And we didn't know that it wasn't true. And so this is not in any way an indictment on anybody else that may have told you something different. Okay, this is not an indictment on anybody. This is not a, a slight or negative criticism about anyone. I just want to, to equip you what I've been equipped with and it has blessed me from doing so. When we read any book of the Bible again, that's we use that to best determine who is the author. And if we don't know, we don't know, and that's okay. Because uh, as we talk about humility in Sunday's message, you and I don't mind not always getting credit for what we do 
and what God does through us. Some of the authors, human authors of the Bible, are in the same boat. They're in the same vein. They, uh, we don't know who they are, who they were, and nothing is wrong with them. There are some people I've had conversations with that when I show them what the Bible says about the author of certain books or authors of certain books, it, it throws them off. Because if the person whose name is on the book or they've been told all their life is, is not the author of the book for some reason that, that, that tears them up. But when we look at Genesis, for example, who have we been told is the author of that book? Where in Genesis do we hear that Moses wrote that book? We don't. When we look at scholarship, literary criticism, and some other uh, ways that we can approach it, there are at least three authors of Genesis. And some of the stories that we have are blended. And then there are two contexts to Genesis. First context is what really happened to those people whose names and families we hear in Genesis. The second level is during the Persian period when uh, the children of Israel were dealing with uh, the Persian Empire, there were some people who wrote and edited this in the form that you and I now have. Go back to Sunday sermon. For interpreting that faithfully, we had to consider what really happened with Judah and Tamar. But also that at the time that the edits and the updates were made, the children of Israel were dealing with whether or not it was okay by God for them to marry people who were not children of Israel. Hence, that's why I mentioned, uh, and I made sure to mention, Tamar was Canaanite, Judah was not, but nothing in the text says anything about that being wrong. The, the, the narrative didn't say it, nor does God say it. Now, God speaks and acts in the text, but it's against Judah and his sons, not Tamar. There were some names thrown around in the text, but it was not by God, nor by the author. It was by people in the, in the community that was saying that about her, right? And then again, she ends up mentioned explicitly in the line of Jesus and the line of David. And that sounds like you're being lifted high, yes. if you ask me. Yes. And so the fact that there are multiple authors of Genesis does not take away that Genesis is the word of God and the impact that it has on our life. Because as Brother Smith was alluding to, and I'm trying to get around to is, if we stick with the Bible, and we trust the Holy Spirit to tell us what it is, and we look for it in the Bible until the Holy Spirit reveals us, we will not go wrong. What we will go wrong is, is we only listen to other people, including me. I'm, I'm a people just like you a people. And I get some stuff wrong. And you all know I've apologized when I've got stuff wrong. And some of you have brought some things to my attention by asking questions and looking at, at certain verses and certain books, and we get that, right? We have to prayerfully read scripture for ourselves. Because when you get to heaven, now you will not be able to say, well, you can say this, but it's not going to hold any water. Pastor Smith said, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I say. It matters what's in this. And it matters your knowledge and understanding of it because that has a relationship in terms of the intimacy that you have with God. Or not. Okay. All right. So that is to say, who open your Bibles to James chapter one. Okay. Almost, almost. Or look on your phone at James. Y'all should be looking at me. You look at your Bible. James chapter one. Okay. I, you know, you two looking at me. Who, what is, what is verse one say? I'll be looking at tonight is James chapter one, verse one. What does that say? So who is the author of James? And we know that because it says explicitly in the Bible that James is the author. 
Now, which James? Is it James that was one of the 12 disciples? Was it another James? And if you're on social media, you can, you can chime in. Yes, you go ahead. Oh, I am. Yeah, go ahead. You weren't, you weren't in my class in the spring, so you could ask. This was James. How do you know that? I read it somewhere else in the book. <laughs> Good answer. All right. So, <laughs> Dean Tyaska, she says the, the earthly brother of Jesus. I asked her, how does she know that? And she said, because she read it somewhere else in the Bible. Now, let's get into our handout because we're going to, we're going to talk about that. All right. Yes. And I read somewhere in the Bible, it said it's half brother. It is, and why is it half brother? But you say brother. But, but why why did why why would we say half brother for that? Now they have the same mother. They got the same daddy. They don't have the God of Jesus daddy. Yeah. There you go. It's and, and that's the only reason it's called half brother. I don't know that we have to call him half brother. Uh and I definitely want to tell you that if you have siblings. And you have one parent, or, or right. no, that's your brother or that's your sister. Right, right. Okay? Right. Even if you just got the same daddy, that's your brother, that's your sister. Right. Okay? All right. Uh, just like we just prayed about the generational peace, that's wrapped up in there. All right? That can create some divisions unintentionally when you do the half stuff. Yes. Okay? And I, and I don't think anybody does the same half brother, half sister intentionally. But, but let it get hot in the kitchen. Well, you ain't we that we ain't got the same, and then it's then and then y'all ready to fight because then they're gonna say something about your mama, say something about your daddy, and then it's gonna be on like how to put pop. That's your brother, that's your sister. All right. Authorship, it is James. Notice how, however, well, let's let's talk about let's talk about what the Bible says. Acts chapter 15 is where we hear the Jerusalem Council. Okay. And we hear not only what James says, but his position. He is essentially the pastor at that time of the Jerusalem church. And he has the authority partially because he's Jesus's brother to be in that place, not only to say something to those who were still in Jerusalem, but to anybody who was outside Jerusalem in the church, if they said it came from James, and just as we talked about with uh, uh, Judah on Sunday and that, that seal and all of that, there was some kind of way of authenticating those letters that it came from who, who they said it came from. Because there's a lot of letters written in, uh, a lot of, a lot of well-written letters and all of that, but they had to have a way of knowing that it actually was from the Jerusalem church and it was from James. And so that was able to do that as it was shared. All right. Then look at Acts 21. I'm not going to read the passage. You see that it's kind of lengthy. I want you to read it on your own uh, so you can see what we're discussing. And the other piece is we went through this uh, in the sermon series uh, a couple of years ago. And so we, we, we read it together somewhat. And then Paul goes back to Jerusalem uh, to visit. And he specifically said that he goes to visit James. And then it's about uh, getting some clarification <laughs> as to uh, what can be done. Uh, how to communicate the gospel, and not how to communicate it verbally and in written word, but how to live it out, okay? So we see that in Acts chapter 21. And the way that James communicates there, uh, who wrote Acts? Don't be scared. Okay, Luke wrote Acts. How do we know Luke wrote Acts? I take it. <laughs> She read it somewhere else in the Bible. That's a good answer. As long as you know you're telling the truth. Because, you know, we, we talk about uh, communicating scripture. That does not mean you got to walk around quoting scripture all the time. Or, or absolutely knowing where that verse was or that information is. As long as you know it's in the Bible, that's really what it's about. And you know how I know that? Because when this letter, these letters were written, they were not written chapter one, verse such and such. That is for you and I to be able to identify them. In a sense, it's like an address or a phone number that we can use to find it. 
Uh, but when these were first published and, and shared, they weren't written with chapters and verses. So it's okay, as long as you know the Bible, even if you cannot say, I know what Proverbs 3, 1 through 10 says, but as long as you know what's in there and it's in the Bible, yeah. that's what's most important. Yeah. And then that, you, that you're doing your best to apply yeah. it, all right? So that's right, that's okay. You know it's in the Bible, that's what's important. And we know that because at the beginning of Luke, Luke says it. And Luke not only wrote Luke and Acts, but then he's talked about it in the Pauline letters in some sense as a confirmation, all right? We saw that at the end of Colossians. Remember, he said, Paul said, Luke has not left me. Or St. Luke, all right? Galatians chapter 2, verse 12 is another cross-reference about James. Uh, we can turn there quickly. All right? And I'll go ahead and, and put this up on the screen for those who are on, on social media as we turn. It is written in Koine Greek. That was a familiar uh the familiar language that was also the language of commerce and so uh, uh james wanted anybody who could pick this up uh to be able to be able to read this and and, and know how to apply faith in jesus christ galatians chapter 2 want to actually read verse 11 as well it says but when cephas that's peter's real uh, that's peter's name other name came to antioch I opposed him to his face because he stood self-condemned for until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. That goes back to the Acts chapter 15 and the clarification that needed to be given. And there was some, some clarification about if, if you want to practice your faith this way, that's fine, but don't force it on other people. That goes back to Jesus. Jesus did not force believing in him on anybody. Still doesn't. And so we're doing that, uh, even if we're manipulating, we got to be careful even when we give the invitation. You know, when we get up and we say, you might go out of here today and have a car accident and die. What's going to happen to your soul? That is not the way we should extend the invitation in the church. That's, that's manipulation. That's that's in, that's trying to get people to believe in Jesus based on fear. Mm -hmm. That's not inspiring anybody. That's not loving on anybody. That's not sharing joy and peace with anybody. That's manipulating and trying to scare them into believing in Jesus. And I don't recall Jesus. Did he tell people to repent? Absolutely. Did he tell them to get themselves together? Absolutely. But he never intimidated them into believing. And we, since he didn't do it, we don't do it. All right, so um, Peter and Paul had the same calling, but to different people. Peter was Jewish, his calling was to Jewish people. Paul had the same calling, but his calling was to all people. If you remember in Acts, we see there having conversations about what to do, what not to do, and then Peter had that dream where the Lord gave him a picnic, and he had that big square blanket, and he said, who are you to tell people not to eat? what I made. And we can we can really uh, expand that a little bit too, but that's another Bible study for another day in terms of consumption. I'm not going to, if I say it, we're going to get drawn off into a whole other stuff. But we're talking about uh, remembering that when God created stuff on the planet, he said that it was good. And, I, and I'm going to say this and I'm going to leave it right here. If, if it grows on the planet, that means it's something useful. Amen. Just because we abuse it doesn't mean that what it is, that it's wrong. Maybe how we're using it is wrong. Right. Okay. There's another time. All right. So he told that to Peter, and Peter and Paul were then able to move forward, stay out of each other's way. You know, how we say it, they got in their own lanes and they stayed in their own lane. And, and we know they came back together because they were executed at the same time, at the same place. They were in prison together at the end of their lives as well, according to church history. So they were able to come together and they realized they were doing the same thing that would call to different people. And, and that's encouraging to you and I because all of us are on the same team. We're doing the same thing, but in so many different ways. Some of us, are we, are, we have different careers. We're in different groups and social groups. We're in, we're in you know, bowling leagues and golf leagues and all of that. But at all times, we ought to be living for the glory of God. In the education of people, it's just differently based upon how he's created. Then we got personalities. 
We got hobbies. We got uh, interests. All sorts of things. And God can use it all uh, for that, okay? All right. So, first statement of summation. For James, Jesus' resurrection transformed a mere brother into a glorious Lord. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7. Here is why uh, I asked who he was. You all told me correctly that he's the brother of Jesus. But in verse 1 of James, James does not identify himself as a brother of Jesus. What is, how does he identify himself? What is the designation? It's not even a title. What is the designation he gives himself in James chapter 1, verse 1? A servant. Now, here is why. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. Paul says, then let me back up so to get the full picture. Uh, I'll begin at verse three. For I hand it on to you as of first importance that I in turn have received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the 12. Verse six, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them were still alive, although some have died. Verse 7. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. That James is his brother. James was his brother, but James didn't believe in Jesus after the resurrection. Okay, I was just going to ask you, was that that same brother that yep. kind of died? And he had another brother that didn't believe in him either, who now name is on the book of the Bible. Who was that? Jude. Jude. Oh. Jude is also his brother. They didn't believe in him as the Savior until after he was resurrected and he appeared to them and showed them. In other words, they were in the same boat as Thomas. Remember, Thomas said, uh uh, I ain't going to believe until I see the nails and the holes in his wrists and his feet. James and Jude and their sisters, I think they had two sisters. <laughs> it's in Matthew, so I think they had two sisters as well. And if you remember when he came in in their presence, they were saying, Jesus needs to be quiet. Jesus needs to get out of here for these people knock your head off. Jesus needs to stop doing all this stuff. People think you're crazy. We think you're crazy. And that's when he says, my brothers and sisters are those who do the will of the Father. Right? He told them, my true family are those who believe in me and live for me. Right? And, and that was, they they loved him. That was their brother. They grew up with him. Daddy Joseph probably had them all around the table building, building stuff out of wood as carpenters, right? Mm -hmm. But they didn't believe in Jesus until later on. That's one of the reasons he identifies himself as that, because once he knew who Jesus really was, also, let me say this parenthetically, that's why we don't give up on people, nor do we have any issue with how and when they come to Jesus or how and when they get serious about living with Jesus. That's between them and the Lord. Because all of us, all of us have not always been serious about Jesus ourselves, even if we've been in church all day, right? James is in that boat. James went from just being his brother to being his servant. And God is still using James to this. And all of us want to, to be in that in that vein, whoever that God wants to use us for, whatever God wants to use us for, we want to be used in that same way. So whenever we started, or if we have not started, whenever we get started, it is never too late. All right? Any questions before we go to the audience? All right. If you have questions online, type them in the comment section. I'll go back and check and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, you can please participate as we're going through as well. If you ask questions, you can answer them in the comment section as well, all right? The B clause of verse 1, somebody go back there and tell me what it says. James chapter 1, verse 1. I'm sorry. We're gonna give our, go, ahead, go ahead, Brother Smith. James, chapter 3. James, chapter 5. And Jesus Christ. To, to 12 tribes in the This version, say this version, brother. Always time to teach. All right. 
That is the Jewish diaspora. We remember going back to, um, I'm going to put these uh, scripture references up. Go back to Acts chapter 8. Stephen gets stoned. And as he's getting stoned, or after he gets stoned, it says that the church scattered. The people who were part of the Jerusalem church, who were believers in Jesus, they started to disperse throughout the known world. Now, uh, some people may say they should have stood up to the powers that be. Uh, but we got to give them some credit because they said we're not going to stop believing in Jesus, but we're not going to set ourselves up to expedite going to see Jesus. Remember, Jesus, before it was his time, over and over again, it says he went through. He disappeared. No one could find him. And so Jesus knew because it wasn't his time that every harmful situation didn't need to be engaged. And so these people, and there's nothing critical about the people doing this, they were scattered. And in fact, uh, uh, as you see there on that quote, um, from Joe Gregory, holy huddles need to break up into world witnesses. Sometimes we stay, we stay huddled up together too much. Let me translate that. Sometimes we only spend time with each other. Yes. We only want to come to church. The only time we talk about Jesus, sing about Jesus, is at church. We don't, we don't do anything in the public for Jesus and all of that. When that has never been God's intention. This is a this is intended to be a center of the community. Yes. A place where we learn and grow together, but it's for us to then put it into action when we leave here outside of here. And when these people went scattered, that's when the gospel began to spread in all of those places, and it's still spreading today all across the world. Of course, we have to we have to um, make sure it is the gospel and not just uh, certain ideologies masquerading as the gospel. But we have to make sure it's the gospel and it began to spread. And so they began to scatter, and he writes this to the Jewish in dispersion. Again, he wrote it in Greek for anybody to pick it up, but his assignment in, in the initial moment, at that first, the first piece of the context, was ascended to those he had influence. Again, each and every one of us have influence with people. Even the young brother Smiths, they have influence at school because they have friends, classmates even teachers, right? And wherever we are, that means we have opportunities to use that influence. And we have to choose what we're going to use that influence for. And so that's all this is about. He knew those people, they needed to hear it. And, and as we'll see in just a moment, he was aware of some of what they were dealing with and what he wrote in, in James was how to be faithful despite what you're going through despite what you're doing, despite what's coming against you. And just because you get all of this stuff and people and systems coming against you, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to respond in kind. You can be faithful like Jesus would. Don't be no fool, uh, but you can be, you can be faithful, okay? All right, so that's who we wrote to, claiming a summation. Jesus always uses the background of those who he chooses. Does it with James? Does it with Paul? Remember, Paul had the highest level of education. He knew the Bible front, back, up, down, because he was a Pharisee and all of that. And once he got saved, he was then able to interpret all of what he knew correctly and faithfully because of his relationship with Jesus. And if you remember, he disappeared for some time, too. We met him in Acts 9, but he don't come back around for a couple of chapters because he was away just spending time with the Lord, studying Submitting himself to understanding scripture faithfully because he admits over and over in the letters that he wrote that he told some people the wrong stuff. He lived it out wrong. Paul was murdering people in, in God's name and realized some kind of way he skipped over that commandment, thou shalt not murder, apparently. But he realized what he was doing was wrong. When Jesus came into his life and whatever it is for you and for me, we realized some stuff was wrong. And we had to make some changes. And we choose to make those changes. And Paul did as, as he did. Go back to Moses. Remember Moses grew up in, in Pharaoh's house, right? 
And that means he had the highest level of education at the time. He knew he had academics. He had diplomacy because he was Pharaoh's son. He had he had the political service. He knew he knew the economy. He knew all of that stuff. He even knew their religion. And we see how he talked to Pharaoh. He God used all of that to deliver his people. That is to say, if we yield and submit ourselves and our histories and all of that, God will use it. Sometimes that's our testimony. Amen. Baby, I, I did some of that same stuff and, and I had to change whatever it may be. I went through that too. God carried me through it. He'll carry you through it too. Whatever it may be. All of that God will use uh, and he'll, he'll use all of that. So even stuff that we may not like about our life, like about our past, if we are submitted to God, at some point, God is going to use that for us to be a blessing to somebody else. All right? Now, last section, occasion and purpose. This is just a, a bird's eye view of it. Not going to read the passages because uh, beginning in the next session, we're going to go through this book passage by passage, and we'll touch on some of these, not only in the places that we see here, uh, these are some of the most direct in, in, uh, instances in which uh, it is dealt with. So difficulties and persecutions. All right, you see that beginning? We know that we've heard it anyway. Count it all joy when we go through trials. Those are difficulties and persecutions they were having for being followers of Jesus. And we'll consider some of what they were dealing with so we understand uh, that, that sometimes some things that we think of persecution is not persecution, right? Okay. Persecution is specifically in relation to being faithful to Jesus, trying to be a child of God, and that is causing what we're going through. And so we'll, we'll talk about what that is. Well, so about temptations, because sometimes we can mix up trials and temptation. Okay. We'll talk about that. But they were dealing with difficulties and persecution. They were losing houses, jobs, money, family stopped talking to them, uh, all kinds of stuff, all right? Oppression, all right? And you see that reference there is chapter five, verses one through six. And you can go ahead and read these just to get some sense before we get there. But chapter five, verses one through six, talks about oppression. And this is, this is what oppression still is today. And we'll see that a lot of the things that they were dealing with, we still, it still exists today. We may or may not deal with them personally, but we know somebody who does. And, and it talks about not only uh, how to respond to it corporately, but even individually and as families and how we are to respond to, to oppression, all right? Religion, okay? This, isn't, this, is, this is important, and I know this may ruffle some feathers, uh, but, but I, I, I believe it wholeheartedly. Jesus had to come because people were trying to be religious. Religion is, I have to do this, that, and the third to get to God. And we cannot do that. That's why Jesus had to come. And that is, Christianity is a relationship with God through Jesus by experiencing the Holy Spirit. That is Christianity. Let's look at religion just biblically. God gave 10 commandments. And then it ballooned to 613. Ain't no way in the world any person can keep 613 laws. No way in the world. And yet, we see how the Pharisees was acting to, towards Jesus. And then on top of that 613, they had amendments to those laws. That's religion is, do this, do this, do this, do that, and you can get to God. You can have, a, you can have fulfillment. You can have whatever word we want to use with that. That's religion. Christianity is a relationship with God. And so we see those passages, those passages and a couple of more deal with those sorts of things. And you and I also know that the righteousness that we have done, we want to be able to do it because we know the Holy Spirit did it do it and helped us and gave us the courage and inspired us or whatever it may be. All right? So, so it talks about religion, Discrimination. They were being discriminated against, and they were also in danger of discriminating against other people, too. Uh, I've been watching, uh, for whatever reason, lately, I've been um, looking at some stuff and reading some things about Malcolm X. 
And if you know about Malcolm X, if you remember his rhetoric um, for, for most of his career, uh, most of his service was black power, black empowerment. Uh, and he went, he, because of what he had experienced, what he learned from Elijah Muhammad, uh, what they would, what they and some of you experienced in the sixties, it was in reference to white people. He called them white devil, and I mean he called them some stuff, right? But if, but if you know, if if you know about Malcolm X, he had a change when he went on his Hajj, it's called in in Islam. He said he prayed and worshiped with people of all races and ethnicity. And when he came back, he said that he no longer ascribed to grouping people together. And I'm kind of paraphrasing. I don't remember exactly how he said it, but I'm paraphrasing. I'm, I'm no longer going to say that all people are evil just because they look like people who have done evil to me. On the Godfather of Harlem, there's a, it, it's, it's some fictional stuff in there. And there's a conversation he had with the host that I, I don't know if it was real or it was fictional, but it was powerful when I watched it. When he went to Mecca, when he got to the airport, and this is according again to Godfather Harlan, I don't know how accurate it is. Uh, so I want to say that in case some of you are more well-versed with it, I don't know if it was exactly like this or if it happened at all, but it was still a powerful uh, sequence of scenes for me to think through. He got to the airport and the government wasn't letting him in because they questioned whether or not he was really Muslim. It was related to what happened with he and Elijah Muhammad and some other things. And they questioned whether or not he was really Muslim. And he later on kind of thought through it that, of course, to the show anyway, that it was because of how he was talking about other races and ethnicities other than Black people, right? So he, he's not let into the country, he's jailed, and then a lawyer comes to get him who is white. And he comes to get him and he says, you have to wait on trial for a few days, but you're welcome to come stay with us. And, and Malcolm X is like, no, I'm all right. And he said, okay, he said, well, you're welcome to come stay with us, but if you prefer to stay in jail over the weekend, I can't remember how many, it was over the weekend and then some days, that's fine, but you're welcome to come stay with us. So. The guy's walking out and he says, okay, I'll go stay with you. He was still hesitant, but he had, he had a choice. He's going to stay in jail or I'm going to go stay with white people. Goes and stays with them. And then the lawyer works on his behalf. He gets permission to go on the Hajj. I don't know. They don't show how or say how. They confirm that he was Muslim or what have you. But he then, he says, I've never been shown kindness by a white person. And the man tells him, he says, you are in danger and are already doing what you claim has been done to you. He said, you are treating all people one way just because how they look. And all people are not like you. And then that man goes on the Hajj with him. And remember when, he, when, when Malcolm X, I'm going to call him Muhammad Ali, when Malcolm X comes back to America, he then has a change. And he welcomes anybody to worship with him as long as they are not themselves racist, so on and so forth. And so when we look at this discrimination here, we can, because of the trauma we've experienced, write off certain people because they look a certain way. Not only racial, but we can also do it with gender. One man was raggedy to me, so I don't want no other man. Some women will do that and say that. A man, one woman does them wrong. I, all women are this, all women are that. I don't want no women. Because of how one or, or, or maybe a handful have treated, but they're still not all of them. And so, and so what we'll see here in all of these areas, including this last one, it is not only how to respond to these issues, but to respond to it faithfully so that we don't then do it to other people either. And that's that's challenging and that's hard because all of us have some trauma we've experienced. Uh, you know, you've heard me say this before, and let me say this racially, 
all uh, skin folk and kin folk anyway. So, so we got to have our antennas up. Don't be no fool because, because as Christians, and, and let me even go broader, as people in general, everybody's not for us, everybody don't like us. But everybody's also not against us. Okay. And so we just and so we get we get some help uh, from Jesus through James in this book about these and other situations where it helps us not only to to faithfully deal with people doing this to us, but us to not do it to other people. Because we don't like our feelings to us, and so we ought to work to not do it against other people. See that last one there? Bitterness in speech and attitude. Uh, perhaps my favorite part in here is about the tongue. And it's funny, some of the stuff and examples he uses about the tongue and how small it is, but yeah, how powerful it is, and you know, what it can do with a horse and what it can do with a ship and all those types of things. Um, and so it's going to be, it's going to be interesting when we get to that, that passage. Because uh, some of us know how to talk and talk it. All right. And you know, I'm 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 in that boat. I'm in that boat. And so it's, that, that passage is, is fascinating. Okay. Any questions uh, or concerns before we uh, close out this introduction? So we looked at authorship, audience, and an overview of occasion and purpose of the book of James. Okay. All right. Brother Smith, you have any questions? You have any questions, Brother Smith? Yeah. Our last statement of summation. Faith impacts the details of our lives and the lives of people around us, locally and globally. Okay. A piece of the context, interpretation, and application of James is the application immediate and, and wide. When God is doing something, he wants us to apply it first locally, but not only locally. And so, and so part of our, our, our engagement of this is discerning how does God want us to continue to be a blessing to our immediate community, starting with our family, Bay City and mid-Michigan and Michigan and, and nationally. But how might God be calling us to be engaged with ministry on a global scale. And you and I are blessed to live in a time we can get on the phone and kind of call anywhere on the planet. Facebook, uh, you know, other means of community, email. You know, it's not completely global, but you know, and, and we even can spend money globally. Some of us have traveled globally and all this. So that, that's a piece of, that's a piece of our consideration, all right? Another difference of this Bible study is we will get homework every week we have class, all right? We will get homework. So if you look at the bottom of your sheet or if you are joining us online, you'll see there on your screen, here is our homework for session two, and this will be next week, all right? Read and listen to James chapter one, verses two through 12, okay? James chapter one, verses two through 12, all right? Okay, let me also share with you, if you want to get ready for service on Sunday, Genesis 39, all right? Uh, Joseph and, and Mrs. Potiphar. You may have heard that story before. We're going to see how we hear it uh, this Sunday, all right? All right. Thank you so much for coming, for your, for your attendance. Even if you're online, thank you so much for coming. Um, it is 725, so we got five minutes to spare. Let's pray. Uh, so we can, we can go home and we will see each other this weekend. Gracious God, thank you for your word. We ask you to open it up to us as you see fit. Bless us to hear it as you see fit. And then give us the courage to live it, but also to live it as you see fit. We want to be a part of your perfect will. We acknowledge we can't just say it and desire it. We have to do it. So please continue to give us opportunity to do just that, to be a part of what you're doing. This is your plan. It's in your son Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Amen. Hello, Dad.